every woman who serves in that capacity. And finally, God, we dare not end this prayer without lifting up the people of Ukraine. We pray for righteousness to prevail over wickedness, faith over despair, and faith over doubt, and hope over despair. And we pray that peace will rule all over the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Retiring Amen. color guards. Or 
give some reason for a deficiency that we are described as a female firefighter, right? Or a lady cop. Why is that? Why is the feminine modifier included to go through the same police academy? We face the same hurdles and challenges. Who we serve and how we serve with bravery and compassion is the same as our colleagues. And I would say that every obstacle you face and every hurdle you hold is a testament to your strength and character. What we do, ladies, needs no modifier or adjective. We are successful because of what we do and that we show up. And I want to tell you that you inspire me. So thank you for showing up. I tell you, there's nothing like women inspiring one another. It really is this really a good thing, you know. And so at this time, um, we have a song. Marlo, come and give us a song. Uh, come on, come on.
woman who wore the East section of Jersey City. And I have the pleasure this evening of first being among all you wonderful women, but second, I will be introducing our keynote speaker for this evening. Our guest speaker is Honorable Tiffany Williams Brewer. Tiffany Williams Brewer is a former New Jersey Administrative Law Judge with, just, with over 20 years of legal experience. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy recently appointed Judge Williams as the first African American to chair the New Jersey State Commission of Investigation. Throughout her career, Judge Williams Brewer has served as a federal prosecutor, representing clients at several large law firms, and served in the senior leadership role in state government, including as New Jersey Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Deputy Chief Counsel to the New Jersey Governor, Chief Counsel to the New Jersey General Assembly, and Regulatory Officer to the New Jersey Civil Service Commission. She also serves as a law professor in the U.S. and abroad, including India and Saudi Arabia. She will be teaching at Harvard University School of Law starting in the fall. Judge Williams Brewer also trains lawyers and judges in the African Union and Middle East. She is currently the secretary of the ABA section of litigation. Judge Williams Brewer is also the co-pastor of Transformation Church with her husband, Reverend Eric Brewer, and the founder CEO of the Esther Project, a women's empowerment nonprofit where she is currently launching the Esther Institute for Advancement of Women and Girls. Let's give her a hand. So before she comes and give us words, we will have a poem by Susan. Uh, and right after Susan graces us with her presence, the next voice you will hear will be that of Judge Williams Brewer. Good evening, everyone. It's my honor and pleasure to be a poet laureate of Jersey City, and it is truly an honor to be here among you. I have the honor tonight of presenting a poem written by Maya Angelou, who is one of my mentors and one of my, one of my inspirations. Many people wonder where my secrets lie. I've got cute or built to suit a fashion model's size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, and the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and to a man, the fellows stand up or fall on their knees. Then they swarm around me, a hive of enemies. I say, it's the fire in my eyes the flash of my teeth, the swing of my waist, and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Men themselves wonder what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the ride of my breasts, and the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Now you understand just why my head's never bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palms of my hands, the need for my care. Because I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, you all are, and me. 
Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderful prelude. And um, I also want to thank our psalmist today for that wonderful, amazing rendition of I'm Every Woman. Y'all are being a little concerned a bit here. You know what's how you are thinking about, you know, the times and as a woman you have to take on more than other people, right? I'm Every Woman, yes. So thank you for setting the atmosphere in here. I want to thank my friend, my friend, my friend. Can we all give it up for the woman of the hour? Thank you, Councilwoman Ridley, for that wonderful introduction. And I certainly have to. It's my tradition to give glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ who's the head of my life. And I can't have that introduction read, which is a testimony of what God has been able to do in and through my life and offering it in service to Him without honoring Him as well. I also want to recognize my husband is with me tonight, Reverend Eric Brewer, who I serve in ministry with. He's a senior pastor of Transform Church. He's also the president of the Fellowship of Black Churches in Hackensack in the vicinity. And he's my best friend. We're newlyweds, you all. So. <laughs> after a journey of having known each other for 32 years. So uh, I, I am excited. Yes. But today I am more excited to look out and see so many amazing women. Yes. Women in service, yep. women in action, women in leadership, and the men that support them as well. So I want you to give yourself a standing ovation. I want you to stand up for yourself and you can stand up tonight because you are worthy of this and we shall honor. So I want to thank you as you take your seats for your service, for your sacrifice, for your dedication. I love public service, but certainly you're serving at the highest level of giving your life on the line. We don't want to take that for granted during Women's History Month. So I'm honored to be here for the occasion. And usually when I speak, I give a call to action. So today's remarks are, are really uh, a call to action to you. I'm going to call those who are in leadership to action first because when we look statistically, since it's Women's History Month, right, let's look at the numbers. Only about 13% of full-time law enforcement in our country are women. And the number is smaller when we look at women in leadership positions. In fact, my closest girlfriend is an assistant special agent in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration. She is one of a handful, less than a handful, I should say, of women at that level in the DEA. She is certainly, the number gets smaller. She's a black woman, women of color, it gets even smaller. So there's work to be done, and we know that statistics also show us that female officers' presence has a positive impact on the community and the overall performance of law enforcement departments. We see that trend in business as well, that women that own businesses add to the bottom line of businesses. We know that female officers are statistically less likely to face allegations of excessive force and can reduce the use of force among officers in an entire department. We see that only 8% of our volunteer full-time firefighters throughout the United States, which constitutes about uh, 6,200, are women throughout the country, and only 700 are serving at the rank of lieutenant or captain and the statistics that I can find were a little sketchy on even really capturing those who are captains or, or chief, I'm sorry, fire chiefs. But it's estimated that approximately 150 women throughout the country at any given time are serving in the role of fire chiefs. So the first call to action is for those of you that are in leadership. Opening doors of opportunity for women in law enforcement and in firefighting and making sure that the women that are hired are promoted, are retained, are developed for leadership, are being paid equitably, and are serving in an equitable manner as well. So that's our first call to action. 
And that takes intentionality and proactivity on the part of those that are serving in leadership. So when is the last time you, you did an audit to really see what the experiences are, statistically, empirically, and my actual experience of women that are serving? Even from my view, it's behind you. I look up and I see all the pictures of the former chief executives of the city of Jersey City. And I, I do not see enough female representation. Uh, I don't see enough women of color as well. We have work to do. Uh, so that's my challenge to those that are in leadership today, serving and empowering the women that are before us. But today I want to talk to you about being visionary women and leading with courage, civility, and purpose. This is your call to action. So it's my intent today to pour into you. You so into our lives so much. I want to pour into you and get you to think about more than just the day-to-day -day pressure and stress of what you give on the line every day, but to think about your life more holistically and then drill down because I want you to be a purposeful person that's coming every day and getting fulfillment. So when we look at vision and being a visionary woman in the role that you're in, vision is the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination and wisdom. A visionary is a person with original ideas about what the future will or could be like. So as women are taking law enforcement by storm, we should do so as visionary leaders and thinking about what it could look like. As women firefighters are taking action and taking leadership, we should think about what should firefighting look like when women are leading and are uh, in the ranks in large numbers. Uh, Helen Keller said the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but has no vision. Uh, profiles, this is Women's History Month, I want to give you a profile of a few women in history that represent some of these principles. So one visionary I want to leave us with today is Mary Wright Edelman. She was born in South Carolina, an African-American woman who was valedictorian of, of her class at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. She went on to Yale Law School. She became the first African-American woman admitted to practice law in the state of Mississippi, and she worked for Dr. King. She founded the Children's Defense Fund, which has been in existence for over 45 years, and one of the lawyers that she hired right out of law school was Hillary Rodham Clinton. Uh, her work went on to persuade the United States Congress to overhaul foster care, support adoption, improve child care, and protect children who were homeless, abused, neglected, and as she expresses it, if you don't like the way the world is, you have an obligation to change it. Just do it one step at a time. So visionaries do it one step at a time. So let's look at courage, and I want you to ask yourself, do I lead with courage? You may have the uniform, you may have the badge. I might ask, let me add, I, I know that I'm at the pinnacle of my career now because I finally have a job as the chair of the State Commission of Investigation where I have a badge. So I am so excited. I don't know if my husband's more excited. He's like, can we use the badge now? And I'm like, no, honey, that's don't just flash the badge, get out of tickets. Okay. So I have a badge now. But are you leading with courage? Courage is the ability to do something that frightens one. Someone who's fearless or valiant, which is really acting in spite of fear. Gloria Steinem says being brave is not being unafraid, but feeling the fear and doing it anyway. When you feel fear, try using it as a signal that something really is about to happen. So you all have situational awareness of what it means really to be courageous in what you've been trained to do, but I want you to think about your life even more holistically. Where are the areas where you need to translate that same level of courage to other decisions that will increase the quality of your life and serve others and maybe even put you on a different trajectory in your own career? Do you lead with courage? Courage can also 
represent resilience, which is strength in, in the face of pain or even grief. Uh, Maya Angelou said, we may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. It may even be necessary to encounter the defeat so that we can know who we are. So that we can see, oh, that happened, and I rose. I did get knocked down flat in front of the whole world, and I rose. I didn't run away. I rose right where I had been knocked down. That is the essence of courageous leadership. Are you rising right where you've been knocked down? So I thought about it in wanting to share some women in history with you today through these remarks. Uh, a profile of courage being Harriet Tubman. One of my favorite people, the anniversary of her death is later this week on March 10th. You know, she was an abolitionist and a suffrage, a suffragist. She was born a slave and she started the Underground Railroad, bringing slaves to the North and her claim to fame is she never lost a passenger because she helped countless children and families. She ended up also being a spy during the Civil War. Uh, but she ended up making uh, so many trips back and forth. Uh, I have the statistic here, but she, she ended up rescuing actually 750 newly freed slaves at one time in South Carolina. Over her life, she made over 13 trips to Maryland over the course of eight years uh, to free slaves, including her own family. And what she had to say about her courage was, I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. This former slave who just decided to be courageous even had international reach because it wasn't enough to go back and forth where she had been enslaved and was a fugitive and go get people and bring them back out as one woman. She then began to shuttle them when it became unsafe even for slaves to be in the north, former slaves to be in the north, she started shuttling them to Ontario, Canada to establish settlements there. So this is the profile of a woman who, in an unlikely circumstance, just used the courage inside her, the strength of her conviction, liberty or death. She was going to have one or the other, but she was going to die trying. So my advice to all of us is to find something that you would die for, but live for it. Live with passion. So do I lead with civility? Civility is formal politeness and courtesy in behavior or speech. We also know it as respect. The author Jody Pickle says, I reach into the abyss and I find my manners. It's just that simple sometimes. Whether in, in business or in life, you can be civil and get ahead. This is Christine Pora in the book Mastering Civility. Whatever your age or circumstances, you can master civility. So what are you doing today to connect with others? What kind of legacy are you leaving? Are you lifting people up or holding them down? In each moment, we get to choose who we want to be. Who do you want to be? That was author Christine. Who do you want to be? You know, as an administrative law judge, I, I heard a lot of civil uh, service, uh, police discipline uh, cases in particular. And uh, this concept of civility is something that we still have to grasp onto when we're thinking about a dispute resolution. How do we move forward when we hit a wall, when we hit a wall of misunderstanding even, uh, whether it is outward facing with the community or internally in our own organizations. But instability actually costs. Workplace stress costs, costs the U.S. economy approximately $500 million annually. Wouldn't you like to have a little less stress in your life? Civility can help that. It also costs 46% higher in healthcare costs. Uh, relationship issues at work are certainly the greatest 
source of stress, statistically speaking. 66% of respondents in one study I saw uh, declined in their work performance because of instability. 63% lost work time avoiding an offender in their workplace. 80% lost work time worrying about work relationship difficulties. And 12% left their job due to instability at work. So are we leading with stability? Uh, the late uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Sandra Day O'Connor actually wrote a book together uh, called Sisters in Law, and they shared the narratives of, of the struggles of really coming up as, as one of the only women graduates of their institutions and trying to get law jobs and being told things like they couldn't get a certain job because uh, the men's wives would be upset that they were working with a woman. And so imagine you've gone to you know, Harvard Law School and you graduate and this is what you're told. But they're, they're both together writing about their experiences and finding commonality, though you have one conservative justice and one liberal justice, they found a commonality as women to try to create a culture of civility, even in teaching and training other women leaders. So finally, do I lead with purpose? Purpose is the reason why a thing exists. So what about you? Why are you here? Got purpose? What are you here for? Is this just a good job? Is it just great financial remuneration? Is it great, you know, pension on the other side? Is it an opportunity to retire early and start a second career? What is your purpose upon which you go to work and serve every day? Tapping into your purpose helps you with every aspect of your life fulfillment. You were purposed by design, and so even your happiness can be tied to your adherence to your purpose, as does your authenticity and your integrity. It's all tied to who you authentically are and why you are even here. Your purpose helps you to be confident in boldly being who you were created to be, and we see a difference in how you go to work and show up every day in times of crisis if you're leading by your purpose. So as visionary women, or those of you that are empowerers of visionary women, lead with courage, civility, and purpose, and use your voice. Madeleine Albright, the first female in the United States, uh, Secretary of State said, it took me quite a long time to develop a voice, and now that I have it, I am not going to be silent. I live by that mantra. So refuse to be silent. Be relevant, be excellent, be transformational, be a visionary woman. Lead with courage, stability, and purpose. So John Maxwell, in closing, John Maxwell says in his book, Leadership 101, and I adapted it for the, uh, to say herself instead of himself, but achievement comes to someone when she is able to do great things for herself. Success comes when she empowers followers to do great things with her. Significance comes when she develops leaders to do great things for her. But a legacy is created only when a person puts her organization into the position to do great things without her. So live your life of purpose and leave a legacy. It is your responsibility in service to the world and to whom much is given, much is required. But let your purpose-filled life tell the world, I was here. So thank you for the opportunity today to give you that call to action. I appreciate you. Continue to celebrate Women's History Month and use your voice. Thank you, y'all. <laughs> you know, um, one thing in life I've learned, you don't have a choice on what color you're born into, and you really don't have a choice of what sex you are. You don't have that choice. 
But when you get to earth, you can make a choice that you'll make something out of your life. When you look at your life, I'm quite sure everybody has a story. You know, uh, I was not born into wealth, and I'm quite sure some of you can identify you wasn't born into wealth. But you made a decision that you want more out of life. And in making that decision, one of the decisions you made, that's why I want to make sure I honor women who are police and fire. You made a choice that every day that you're going to put your life on the line for someone else. To me, that is an awesome task. I, I'm going to be an but someone is equipped to make a decision that I'm willing to die to save someone else's life. And so for that, ladies, I really salute you. I don't just say that I'm you. I really salute you. Because you made that decision that you will put your life on the line for someone who you really don't know. You really don't know that you made that decision. So on this woman's Day, International Women's Day, and it's, this is one day, but it's really the whole month. We celebrate women the whole month, you know. And I tell people, when you understand the history, why we have to celebrate, you know, black history, you know, why we have to celebrate, you know, Irish history, you know, why we have to celebrate Italian history, because when you understand it all, we would not notice. That's why we celebrate. Why do we celebrate uh, Puerto Rican Day? Because it wasn't noticed. So people got together and say, hey, I'm a part of history here. You can't eliminate me. So women, we are part of history here. You can't eliminate us. You can't eliminate us. We can't have American history without having women involved. Because we were at the forefront of so many things. So today and every day of this month, not just this month, celebrate you. Thank you. 
Reverend Tara Walker. Firefighter Michelle DeBlanc. Firefighter Colette Caputo. Firefighter Brianna Rodriguez. <laughs> Firefighter Francesca Zampa. Firefighter Lysandra Rosari. <laughs> Firefighter Angelica Athen. Firefighter Desiree Hillis. <laughs> Firefighter Jessica Suarez. and firefighter Taylor Allen. Captain Kelly Tesla. Sergeant 
Yamalin Arroyo. Sergeant Rossi Audley Marzola. Sergeant Denise Dominish. Sergeant Joe Margaret Yeager. Sergeant Tomina E. LeBron. <laughs> Sergeant Samantha Maxine. Sergeant Luz D. Rojas. Sergeant Justin Walton. Sergeant Cynthia L. Schultz. Sergeant Maria M. Cortez. Okay, we have one more uh, special presentation. I'm going to ask if Michelle Murphy will come up to the podium. <laughs>
and whereas after 37 years of service, she retired in 2000. She was a successful entrepreneur. For over 79 years, she was a faithful member and mother of the church at Monumental Baptist Church in Jersey City. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Jersey City Municipal Council hereby honor the memory of Dorothy Rebecca Allen Belcher, a phenomenal woman in every sense of the word, a woman of faith, generosity, compassion, advisor, and advocate for children.
part of uh, what we should do when we're fortunate enough to help. And I partner with the community food bank. Some of you may know it, you know. And so they're getting ready to do a drive, and they call it their period product drive. Okay. I'm asking all women to just send some type of high, uh, hygiene, some type of sanitation, sanitary, sanitary, uh, yeah. sanitary items. <laughs> I want to say thank you. I hope something we did tonight encouraged you. You know, I know you're on the front line, and I want you to know I believe you. I really do. God bless you. Thanks.